of inciting campaign won its first high court action at, against Umbor Panala. Um, this was about Umbor Panala granting permission for a development near Connolly Station, um, but included some dodgy understanding as to how car parks work in the planning law. This uh, ruling has already had quite significant implications in the planning sector. Um, and we're seeing a lot more attention paid to both bicycle parking and car parking in all future strategic housing developments, referencing the details of this case. So this is probably one of the first times we've ever done a court action and it's having kind of lasting impact, um, which was fantastic. Uh, let's skip over that. I suppose like the last year has been dictated a lot by COVID and COVID restrictions. And so you're not gonna see a lot of photos in here of big 500 person Liffey cycle events that kind of we all know and love. We spent a lot of time on Zoom talking to each other and sharing ideas. And some of these kind of online meetings we had have been fantastic. Um, and a huge credit to so many of the volunteers who helped pull them together. Um, like new year, new opportunities, um, this sort of a kind of why we cycle, the 10 stories from different people across Dublin was fantastic. Um, this is from our air quality one. Um, this is probably one of my favorite moments where we were doing an online meeting about kind of cycle holidays in Ireland and Michelle Hardiman called in to the meeting live from her cycling holiday. Uh, I thought it was just a pretty magic moment for showing kind of, um, how fantastic the online format is for kind of letting people engage or get involved in, in the campaign. I think one of the things that's been very obvious over the last year is that there is very much a changing landscape. And I mean this in many different ways. I think COVID has shown us how we can use outdoor space very differently. The way we use outdoor space is essentially the core idea of Dublin Cycling Campaign. Um, Many years in the campaign would feel like we've been squandering public space in our cities, which have not been making them as livable as they could, or creating enough safe space for people to walk and cycle and use public transport. And the last few months has absolutely changed that conversation in Dublin. And you can see that in the response to the public consultations for Cable Street and Parliament Street, where over 7,000 people are, vote, are banging down the door of, D of Dublin City Council to try and get more pedestrian and cycle space in the city. Um, We've seen new infrastructure roll out across the city. Uh, this happened in November last year, and I think it's probably one of my favorite pieces of cycling infrastructure, not only because it's great cycling infrastructure, but it's the first time I think you can actually stop and appreciate the front of the front ports. Um, we're seeing new designs for cycling infrastructure that are quickly built popping up all over the city, and that's been fantastic. We've seen long awaited projects like parts of the Dodder Greenway open up in the last year. Uh, these fantastic new bridges over, over the dollar. We've seen a changing landscape within some of the public bodies as well. Uh, this is the Cycle South Dublin plan announced by uh, South Dublin County Council in the last year. And they're already starting to make progress on connecting the bits of existing cycle infrastructure together with new high quality projects. Um, this is a new project they announced only about a week ago. Like they are really starting to get it in South Dublin. They have lots of problems still, but they're, they're making good strides. We're seeing all of the mayors in Dublin take photos of bikes. This is Alison Gilliland in Dublin City. Um, this is uh, Peter Kavanagh in South Dublin. Uh, this is Shana Arudic in Fingal. And this is Leslie McCarthy in Mary. All of the councillors in Dublin taking photos with bikes. We're seeing new people kind of join the community. The, the bike hub in Dunleary has been absolutely fabulous and huge credit to Stephen McManus and his team out there. The work that they are doing is showing, it, it's just, it's absolutely incredible. Like by giving bikes to people who need them, teaching skills to people, they are a really great example of social enterprise. Um, the other thing I want to touch on this year of you is, I think there's just been a huge example of people power over the last 12 months. Um, a lot of small, locally focused campaigns making tremendous um, impact across the city. Um, some of the work that kind of David Timoney and co have been doing in Sandy Mount has been absolutely fantastic um, about trying to complete the coastal cycleway. Um, 
construction did start on the project, albeit very temporarily, until the High Court both halted the sunny mid cycle way and then eventually struck it down. This is obviously not the end. The appeals are ongoing in the courts. Unfortunately, that's going to be a slow progress. But I think it, it was interesting to see how the Sunday Mount Cycleway became part of a national conversation because the Irish Times wanted it to be a national conversation. But there was an interesting element about the discussion and how it shifted, I think, both in Dublin and nationally. The DLR active skill travel routes have been running into a bit of difficulty. Um, one of the three is going to continue full steam ahead, and the other two are kind of pending yet another public consultation and public review. Um, but as a result, we've seen, particularly because the Dean's Grange Road section, which is the most controversial part, these kind of locally organized, family-oriented campaigning groups pop up who have come together to organize their local community. There was 300 people out on this cycle in Dean's Grange lots of families, young kids, cargo bikes, um, a fantastic example of small, local, focused community action um, that is absolutely amazing. Um, just huge, huge turnout. I think one of the smaller examples of small community action that I really liked over the last year was a group of residents in kind of the Stony Badger Smithfield area all banding together and getting local businesses inside, getting local councillors, TDs and senators on board and writing to Dublin City Council saying Queen Street needs a two-way cycle track. And that's exactly what Dublin City Council are now proposing to do. A really great example of bringing local community together, um, which I've absolutely found amazing over the last year. We know how much of a problem kissing gates can be and they are an absolute plague across the city. Um, but we have started to see some movement in all the local authorities in removing these restrictive barriers from across the city. And that's been no thanks down to kind of many, many people and the Kiss the Gates Goodbye campaign. This is a, a Kiss and Gate in Fingal that's been removed. Um, Dunleary has been fantastic. I think they've removed close to 25 Kiss and Gates, uh, which has been amazing. Um, and I think the last element of people power that I want to focus on that I think has just been absolutely fantastic for the last year has just been from the cycle buses. Um, so this is the D7 cycle bus, um, Grace Park Road on the right, D12, D8. Um, I've missed row 14 in here, sorry about that. Um, but I just want to show just how amazing this local like campaigning superpower is, how they're both enabling kids to cycle to school but also starting to see infrastructure delivered along these routes to help these cycle buses. So that parents don't need to act as human shields for their children cycling to school. I think if I just want to kind of wrap up, like there's a lot we can be thankful for in this last year. It's been a very tough and difficult year, but at the same time, we've seen changing landscape for the better. And we've been seeing communities rallying together in the push for more positive change. So I think we've got a very positive year to look forward to, building on the shoulders of people from this year. That's all I kind of want to talk about. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Pascal to do a bit of a financial update. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, the slides have, or the, the numbers have been circulated in the pack, so I won't dwell too long on them, but if anyone has any questions, either ask now or at the end of the meeting, or just drop me, drop me a note. But um, the way that the numbers lined up here is 2020 is a full year, and those, odd, those accounts have just been audited, and 2019 is for comparison. The numbers for 2021 are just year to date, so it's the nine months up to the end of September, so the numbers will look a little bit smaller. But the key message is that in 2020, due to a significant jump in memberships, both individually and in obtaining um, to uh, significant corporate memberships, our income receipts um, were, were significantly up on the prior year, notwithstanding the fact that we didn't get any grounds for organizing the likes of St. Patrick's Day Parade or Bike Week events or anything like that. Um, and correspondingly, our expenses were down because obviously everything has gone virtual, so there wasn't the very many activities being organized during 2020. There was no trips to Bella City, et cetera. Um, so as a result, our, our expenses were significantly down, resulting in a, quite a large surplus for 
of 20,000 for uh, 2020. Uh, for the current year to date, um, receipts are still holding up well as regards uh, individual memberships. The corporate memberships um, are we're working on getting those renewed um, with, the, with the with the individual cor corporations, but it's a slow process. Um, but our expenses are up, and the big bulk of those expenses you'll see in the minute is supporting um, cyclists.ie with the national cycling coordinator. But to break down the um, the income. Um, sorry, just move around the little picture. Um, as, I said, as, as I explained, the individual memberships um, has jumped um, greatly during 2020 and is continuing that trend in 2021. Uh, corporate membership, as I said, 15,000 was, was received. Um, and uh, as to be expected because of uh, COVID, all of those, um, those events we would previously have organized over many years didn't happen. So the, the grants we would have got for those didn't. Um, they didn't come true uh, in 2020, um, but hopefully in 2022 they, they, they will start recurring again. Um, so numbers, the numbers for income was, as I said, jumped from 43 to 42, and uh, is sitting at 17 so so far year to date. But we're hopeful that some of those corporate memberships might come true, and uh, the, re the re remaining three months of the year will show continued growth in individual memberships. On the expense side, Vinny, okay. yeah. Thanks. So as, as, as I explained, you'll see a significant reduction 2019 to 2020 on the various events. Um, our support from the campaign for the National Cycling Coordinator um, increased from seven to 10 in 2020 uh, and has gone up to 20,000 this year um, due to other sources of income not coming through, uh, which so basically the DCC has stepped in to, to uh, continue funding the role there. Um, so kind of our expenses have gone up, but we're in a, um, is the next page, Vinny? Um, no, that that's all we have. Sorry if I missed something. Is, there, is the next page the balances or is it the first page? Sorry. Uh, it's the first page there. Yeah, quite, yeah. so if you see there, so our bank balances um, are still in quite a healthy, healthy position. Um, they've been 43,000 at the end of 2020. Um, it's gone, gone down now to 35,000 right, right now as due to the deficit in the year to date. But it's still a very healthy position uh, and it gives the campaign um, a good fund to um, support any initiatives that we wish to support um, and lots of uh, good ideas are already in the mix um, but we're always looking for more um, so it's a good position to be in and uh, hopefully it will continue okay any questions Sorry. Point out, I think there's around was it 938 members at this stage. Yes, uh, exactly. I think we 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 crossed the the thousand members um, in 2020. So kind of um, between both organisations. Um, so it's um, reflected in the numbers there um, and showing the continued strong growth of the campaign, and hopefully that upward tra trajectory continues. Over to Maureen. Hi. Um, can you? Yeah, you can see my slides. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maureen for sites. Some of you may know me from semi public meetings and other, other venues. But as well as that, I am chair of the company, um, Dublin Cycling Campaign, Company Limited by Guarantee. And the company was set up oh, about, 20, about 20 years ago, not long after the campaign was founded. Um, because it's considered good practice to have um, for to incorporate um, voluntary bodies um, and give them the protection of limited liability. And after that, the things just kind of growed like topsy, and it became clear to to us in recent years that really the structures that we had had outgrow, you know, were no longer fit for purpose, that they were they were too much too ad hoc, and that we should um have a look at organizing ourselves in a better in a better fa fashion. Um, the present structures are unclear with confusing names and roles and responsibilities. And I'll show you we, the next slide will show a diagram. We won't go to that yet. It's not helping us to campaign and certainly it's it's hampering generation of income because really um there it, there are organizations out there that would be willing to support 
things like cycle campaigning, but until we get our, our proper structure in place, they're not coming forward to support us. It's not good for the membership and for the volunteer base for it not to be clear where everybody stands. And it's not a great base from which to try and grow groups and membership and volunteers and, as I said, funding. So for the last year or so, um, principally the board, but also people on the executives of Dublin Cycling Campaign and Cyclist.ie have been discussing how to improve the structures. And we looked at a number of proposals. We consulted with various people and we did a survey of interested parties and we still you know, are talking to lots of people and will want to talk to lots of people going forward and I'll come, well no maybe I'll deal with that because we are trying to come up with a new structure and we will need to do a lot of work to put it in place and we will be looking for people to engage in focus groups so if anybody's interested put your name into the chat now and we'll get you involved in a focus group later so if I could have the next slide please Vinny with the structures on it this for those who don't know it, is our present structure um, as I said, we have a limited company, Dublin Cycling Campaign, CLG. Um, we have a board of seven people, um, and uh, mostly Dublin Cycling Campaign, but cyclist.ie representation as well. Um, and we have two different organisations in that. We've got the Dublin Cycling Campaign, um, which I presume everybody's familiar with, which has the guts of a thousand members. Um, in recent years, we have developed local campaign groups specifically in the four, in the local authority areas in South Dublin, Dunleary, Ratdown and Fingal. And we also have a few issue groups which are associated with the campaign. Love 30, in which I'm involved myself, grew out of the campaign. Um, Cycling Without Age, um, which I think started independently, is now associated with us. And we've also developed, as many of you may know, quite a strong group focusing on kissing the gates goodbye. Um, then side by side with that, we have cyclist.ie, which was set up as the national body, the Irish Cycle Advocacy Network, as the national body to bring all the cycling campaign groups around the country together. And we have several cycling campaigns in the major cities and increasingly in towns like Band and Clonakilty, Navan, Drogheda, places like that that would not be regarded as cities, but where we're getting active, active cycling campaigns. And we have a number of associate member groups as well. So, as I say, we've been looking at this for the last year or so, and we've come up with a model that we think is the right one to bring us into the future. So here we are. Thank you very much, Vinny. Um, the first thing to say is that we have a name up there for the new organization, but that is only a holding name. Um, it's, I think there's general agreement that the existing name of the national body, cyclist.ie, is not isn't really suitable going forward. It's um it's it's a domain name rather than an actual proper name. It's very difficult. You can't register it with the company's office. And it doesn't always, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't say what, it doesn't mean what it says, or it doesn't say on the tin what it's about. So what we're looking at is a national, one single national member organization, and that everybody who's involved in cycle campaigning would join, join the national organization. And we're urgently trying to get a good name for that. So all suggestions are very welcome. I say there's your there's your holding title, Irish Cycling Campaign CLG. So it would still, we would change the name of the company to whatever it's agreed the national organization should be. There would be an annual members meeting to which all members would be would be entitled to attend and vote. And they would join, they would vote in an executive committee to run the organization and then people individuals would become members of the group but they would also join with their local organized organized groups and that we would still have a Dublin cycling campaign working within the national organization for better cycling facilities for Dublin we would have the Cork the Cork Waterford Limerick etc and um, we would have the issue groups like Love 30 Kiss the Gates Goodbye 
um, citing without age. And also we would see that issue groups would come and go, that people would set up issue groups to deal with current topics and that they might, they might, they don't always have to last forever, that they might be just there to deal with the current topic and then they would disband when the issue was dealt with. Um, there would be um, a facility for associate member groups for people who want to be associated with the organisation but haven't yet decided to affiliate fully. And there would also be, you know, we would associate with non-affiliated groups as well. So that's the kind of structure we're proposing. And if you could move on to the next slide, please, Vinny. Um, these are what we see as the benefits of the revised structure that we'd be stronger together under a common name and we'd be one powerful united all island cycling advocacy organization. And the all island bit is interesting because the, there is a group beginning to get organized in Belfast that would probably want to come in under the umbrella as well and um, which would make it an all-island organization which would be attractive and um, we want to attract and engage more members and volunteers and by having a very recognizable national brand we think we will that will attract more people um, we also believe that having a better organized body will be more attractive to people who want to fund us and the general perception is that there are organizations out there who want to exercise corporate social responsibility and want to support, and particularly in current times with the whole climate issue, want to support a group like ourselves. Um, and we really need the funding. I mean, at the moment we have the National Cycling Coordinator part-time, but I mean, ideally we should have a full-time National Cycling Coordinator and we should have administrators and, you know, really have, you know, have a professional group that could support us in our campaigning. Um, we feel that we can grow the team of staff um, and share it with everybody, that we'll retain democracy and we can still deal with local issues. Um, compliance with the law is important. I think that the whole voluntary scene has changed in recent years and issues have arisen in organisations because they didn't have good governance procedures. And I think it's important that we have good governance procedures and that they're clear and that everybody understands what they are and who's who. Um, and that will help to manage risk, which again is part of governance. We've got to manage risk. risk. Um, it'll allow for growth. We want to get bigger and better. We want more and more people um, volunteering to campaign for better cycling in Ireland. And it will allow membership by groups who haven't yet decided what they want to be part of so they can become associated with us and then when they feel more comfortable can join the organization so we're planning to progress this and um, starting now we will be consulting with various groups we will hopefully be setting up focus groups we'll be looking for people who have expertise and things like corporate governments legal affairs and interest in structures to come on board and help us to um really design the new structures and to put in place proper governance that will see the structures go, go, going forward and that we will be able to rename the organisation, get approval, retain our charity status with the charity regulator and with the revenue commissioner so that we can get donations tax free. So we'll be looking for help from everybody and if anybody has any questions I think I'd be happy to answer them. I see some things in chapter I haven't looked. There is no questions in the chat just yet. We'll give it another moment or two. Yeah, yeah. National Cycling Club of Ireland. Keep them rolling. Keep the suggestions coming in. And, you know, if anybody wants to come up with any more information, I suppose, um, you can email myself or info at cycling at uh, Dublin. Info at DublinCycling.com. Um, if anybody has any suggestions or if anybody wants to volunteer to get involved in planning and implementing this restructuring. Perfect. Thank you, Marie. I don't think we have any questions coming through. That's all right.
Um, I, I, as someone who's kind of been involved in this process over the last year or so, I just want to say like there has been a huge amount of work been done at both the board level and with our national group to try and come up with a, the plan for what we're going to do forwards, moving forwards. Um, this is kind of the unattractive and unsexy work sometimes of running a cycling campaign is trying to get all of our ducks in a row. Um, but this is absolutely going to open huge new doors for us by allowing us to kind of just become a better, more effective, more well-managed organization. So this is a really important issue, even if it's like a little bit dry and a little bit boring, it is absolutely going to make us a better, more effective group in the future. Cool, yeah. okay. No questions coming through there. Um, perfect, okay. So we're gonna move on to the nominations for the committee for 2021-2022. Um, okay there are 14 positions on the executive committee um we have 11 people who have been nominated to go onto the committee this year um when we look at both the gender and geographic quotas that we have for the committee we see that like from the 11 nominations that we have that we are ticking all of the boxes by making sure we've someone from every part of the city we've a good mix of genders um and all of that as we are at 11 out of 14 positions, we don't need to hold an election, but we're still gonna nominate and second everyone here tonight. And then we're gonna kind of quickly run through um, everyone on the committee so they can just like introduce themselves to you, the members. Um, so you know kind of who is the committee for this year and like they'll be just like a little bit easier for you to reach out to and say hi in future. Cool, okay, Vinny, can we start with nominations and seconding for just for all 11. Do you want all, all of them go? Uh, yeah, let's just run through them, if you, if you mind. Cool, you okay. I, I can do that if you want, Kevin. Yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, yeah, so Kevin said there's 14 positions and 11 people have nominated put themselves forward. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone for doing that. Really, really great uh, to, to, to see that. Um, just th there are, uh, before we get into that, there are a number of people who are stepping down this year. Um, so uh, Connor and Kieran and um, Mary Caulfield is also stepping down. Um, and forgive me, I think I might have gone somebody else, but I just want to say thank you very much for everything they have done on the committee um, last year and the last two years and all the work they do anyway. Right. Um, so, uh, the uh, there's just there is a good question there, Colin. Is there a facility to co-op members of the exec? Yes, there is, and we have done that this year. So Emma joined us um, from BLR, Emma Cattle. Thanks, Emma. Emma, and uh, we we can do that, uh, and we will be doing that hopefully uh, in the next two weeks. So uh, could I get a nomination and a seconding for Kevin Baker? And I think Kevin, you are running as chair again. Just I'll nominate Kevin for chair. Okay, so nominated by Mairead and then seconded by Emma. Emma, thank you. All right. Uh, so, if anybody in the um, in the, uh, the attendees, I know you, you can't speak at the moment, but if you want to like put in your nominations and seconding in the oh yeah, we have them in the in the chat as well. So that's great. Thanks for that. Okay, uh, the next one then is Ellen Cullen, our vice chair. Uh, could I get a nomination and seconder for Emma, please? Una here, I'm happy to nominate Ellen. Ellen. Uh, and I second, Pascal. Okay, so that was Una and Pascal, was it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then for Pascal Comerford, our treasurer, can I get a, we got a column for, yeah? Yeah. Colin Ryder, yeah. I'll second. Seconded by Siobhan. Siobhan, okay. yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, for Vinnie Miner. Uh, I'll nominate you, Vinnie. Yeah. This Joan, is Joan here. here. Thank you, Joan, yeah. And I'll second you, Vinnie. Okay, brilliant. Thank you enough to second them. Okay, it's going to hold them over with panel. So the next one then is Mairead. Right for side running again. Could I get a nomination as a uh, secondary? I'll nominate Mairead. Uh, Ellen, yeah. And 
Five seconds. Uh, Pascal. Pascal. Okay, okay, great. Uh, then Siobhan McNamara. I'll nominate Connor, throw me in. Uh, Connor, okay, yeah. And, so and uh, I'll second Una. Una. Okay, great. And then Una Morrison. I'll, okay. I'll nominate Una. Uh, Damon, yeah. And second? I'll second. That was fun. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, now, Joan. Can I get a nominate nominate nominator? I'll nominate Jen. Yeah. Okay. Great. And seconded by. I'll second. Uh, Damien yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Emma. Emma Cahill. Can I get a nom nominator? <laughs> yep. I'll nominate Emma. Okay. I will second Emma. Yeah, I'd second Pascal. Yeah, Pascal, yeah. Okay. Um, now, um, Colin Walsh is not here. Uh, he's not here, so... Um, I, I'd be happy to nominate him. Yeah, so uh, Colin yeah, Ryder has... Yeah, Colin has nominated yeah. as well. I, I, I'll second Colin if you want. Yeah. Uh, so Colin or... And, um, okay. Now, uh, Joe Gilligan. Um, Joe was suggested uh, by Jero Holland from uh, Fingal, so I will nominate Joe. And I'll second. And then I'll second. Um, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's all eleven uh, nominated. And then Damien O'Toole as the national cycling coordinator uh, is already on uh, has his place on the committee. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. That's great. Well, congratulations, everyone, on your uh, very quick election to the committee for this year. Um, thank you so much for putting yourselves forward. Um, it is. It can be sometimes a bit of a time commitment, but it is absolutely worth it. I promise you that. Um, okay, we're gonna kind of quickly just run through kind of all of the individuals here, so you can just kind of really quickly introduce yourselves. Like, honestly, everyone, no pressure. Send a like. A 15 to 30 second introduction is like more than perfect here. Okay. We'll run down the order of names that it is here. So kind of like Kevin, then Ellen, then Pascal, and then after Shvon, we'll jump over to Una. Sound good to everyone? Perfect. Okay. Okay. So I'm Kevin Baker. I'm now, I suppose, the chairperson now for the third year. Uh, I'm based in Dublin City. And I suppose I first got involved with Dublin Slicing Campaign because OPW were trying to build a guard the station on top of a planned greenway outside my house, uh, and that didn't quite sit right with me. Um, but I've been, it's been quite the journey in my last kind of four, I think, or maybe five years involved with the campaign, um, and it's just been absolutely fantastic. So I'm just going to hand over to Ellen. Do you want to kind of introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm Ellen. Um, I got back into cycling about seven years ago, and I think like a lot of people accidentally became an advocate because it's very hard in Dublin to cycle and not get frustrated and not want to do something about it um, and ends up here. Um, I'm a parent, so I've got four kids, so that kind of makes you see the, the, eight, the eight to eight year old thing in action. You see why it's needed um, and obviously I'm closer to 80 than eight as well. Um, and my particular thing, I want to try and do something about in the campaign. Like the last year, I did. I mean, I did. If I said, like, if you'll have seen my face. Um, I did a couple of presentations for some of our public meetings and stuff, which I think the public meetings have been great. Um, but my kind of thing I'm going to try and make make some um, go forward with this year is trying to um, get a volunteering system in place, some sort of volunteer strategy. So, like I saw Miriam there asking how to get involved. We're trying to work out the best way of giving people clear pathways into volunteering um, with, and the best way of us accessing people with particular skills as well. So that'll be kind of the thing. I don't have any particular expertise in it, so it'll be more I'd be kind of I don't know, project managing, I suppose, and trying to um, co-op people on to help me volunteer. But that's the aim for, my, for my, me and the committee this year. Hey, my name is Pascal Comerford. I've been a member of the campaign for probably nearly 20 years at this stage. Um, probably like a lot of us here, I first got, I first went about looking, is there anybody representing cyclists after having an incident with a motorist in Dublin? Um, and discovered the campaign and got involved and have been involved in one way or the other for that, a long number of years. I've been the treasurer for probably 10 years plus at this stage. Uh, I'm an accountant by, by qualification. So 
I haven't got time to get to be writing submissions and all the rest that some of you guys uh, do great work at, but I do have the time to put, to put my financial knowledge and expertise and just making sure that the campaign's finances are kept on the straight and narrow. Um, and um, I'm happy to continue doing this role behind the scenes for another while anyway, and, or until somebody else wants it. Okay. Okay, uh, so my name is Vinnie Myler and I am uh, the secretary of this committee and I'm also the secretary of the, uh, the board of CLG as well. So all things secretarial, uh, that is me. Uh, and if any of you send an email to info at Dublin Cycling, that is also me, right? So um, I am your, your the person at the end of your emails and always very welcome, most of them anyway. Um, but uh, I've been a member of the campaign, oh, I think I've been a member about five or six years, but I think I was at a cycle back in 2004 or 2005 as well. I actually found a video for it and uh, very, uh, I was admired the campaign, they've done great work and they continue to do so. Um, so I just want to continue on anyway, uh, hopefully what I'm doing as secretary is helpful. I uh, want to, to keep doing that, to keep supporting um, the decision-making uh, structure within the organization, you know, making sure our, our meetings are being held, uh, that they're being minuted, um, and uh, just want to keep on doing that, and hopefully start get to cycle my bike again once we go back to work. Hi, I'm Mairead for Sight. I'd like to ride my bike, and I want lots more people to come cycling with me because I think cycling is a great way to reduce carbon emissions, reduce congestion, improve our health, make our, every, make our cities, towns and villages more livable. Uh, I want to see cycling made more attractive for a greater variety of people. There's a lack of women, lack of children, lack of people with disabilities, a lack of people of some social classes. Um, not all nationalities are represented or ethnic groups and other minorities. So I'd like to see us bring more of those people on board to cycle. Um, and that, that's done both by encouraging them and by providing better infrastructure, by getting more money to spend on cycling, etc. So I've been involved for the last eight years and I got active because like Kevin, I didn't like the attitude to the cycling infrastructure in Temple Oak Village, which is absolutely appalling. So um, they're digging it up at the moment, but they're not going to make it any better. And that got me involved in the South Dublin group and um, I've also been involved in Love 30, a campaign for 30 kilometres in our speed limits. And I suppose for the next year, I'm chair of the board of the, um, the company and we're focusing on restructuring. So I'd like to put my focus on that for the next year. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Siobhan McNamara. Um, I'm based in Dublin 12. Um, my day job is a secondary school librarian um, I was very nervous to cycle for a long time I didn't cycle but about five years ago after I moved house it became the sort of most uh, the easiest way for me to get to work um, on a bike and I haven't looked back it's one of the best things I've ever done getting back on my bike and um, I got involved with the campaign just doing some volunteering um, pretty soon after getting back on my bike and then um, joined the executive committee last year and it's been fantastic um, mainly because of all the people I've met. Um, uh, I've been involved in running some of the public meetings and I've also been one of the Dublin Cycling Campaign representatives on cyclist.ie, um, which has been really great to, to find out about things that are going on around the country. And I think it's very important to um, have that national body for people to, to you know, communicate and share resources and feel like we're all part of something bigger as well. Um, we obviously have a lot uh, more to do um, in Dublin in particular, and uh, probably even more so in other parts of the country, um, to make cycling a more um, attractive and a viable option for more people of all ages and abilities. So that's why I'm still really want to be involved um, to, to advocate for basically for more livable streets. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Inna Morrison. Um, like Siobhan, I'm recent conversion to cycling over the past six years or so i have three kids under five and i joined the campaign um last year when i was pregnant so now we have uh three rather than two kids um and 
what I've been doing over the past year is working on the social media content um, and also um, in the year ahead and some of the public meetings, but also in the year ahead, I'm hoping to work on the more corporate sponsorship side of things. Um, and I'm involved. I joined so that my my daughter could cycle to school on her um into primary school and she did on her first day of junior infants last uh the early last month but i'm hoping that it'll be an easier thing for her to do in the future so um contribute to the belmont avenue consultation if you haven't um but yeah over to joan yep um I hope my voice holds up here so um, I'm losing it at the moment but yeah um, a little bit like <clears throat> Ellen I kind of came to be interested in all things sort of cycling activist uh, related um, having returned to cycling I guess what, a, a number of years ago maybe five or so years ago during a bus strike and um, basically my reaction to the absolute state of the city for cycling um, was kind of what prompted my interest in the likes of Dublin Cycling Campaign, I Bike Dublin um, and I got involved in um, co-founding monthly cycles, which are, are rolling along nicely these days. Um, so about a couple of years ago, I joined um, as a member, joined Dublin Cycling Campaign. And then last year, uh, put my name forward for the executive committee. So um, my main interests are both prompted from my own experiences, obviously. Um, so the, the general frustration of, you know, not having... A safe enough city to cycle in. Uh, also, I was put in hospital by a driver, so that's also ha had a bit of an impact. Um, but also my interests are really about um, some of the things that Moraine mentioned around um, the social aspects and the social good of cycling. So whether it's benefiting the environment, benefiting general health, um, and just the inclusive aspect that, that cycling has or has the potential to be because it is a lot more accessible and affordable than driving, but also it, it kind of levels the playing field as well for people <clears throat> of different kind of backgrounds and economic backgrounds and so on, um, that you can actually just get a bike, hopefully, that's relatively affordable, um, and get yourself around your city. So, um, so yeah, I'm very much about sort of the impact on cycling for people. So I don't have that technical mindset. I don't know about planning and drawings and stuff like that but I like I'm interested in the social inclusion aspect really uh, so that's kind of what prompts me so I'm hoping to do a bit more uh, or a lot more hopefully of work on that in the coming year <clears throat> Inclu including around um, reaching out maybe and engaging more with people who are not represented very well uh, at the moment and hopefully improving that for the campaign um, and improving that around um, so ethnic backgrounds uh, people of, of diverse eth ethnic backgrounds are very conscious that we're quite white here tonight um, and also that we're very able bodied uh, we need a lot more disabled people represented in, in the campaign so I'm hoping to do a lot more work on that if possible and um, so hopefully the, the year will be productive to that end um, so thank you very much and I'm next uh, my name is Emma Cahill and um, I've been cycling in Dublin uh, since my last year in primary school in sixth class and I have been cycling ever since I I've, I've never thought about any other way of kind of getting around cities it is the only way and I love cycling and it's the fastest way it is the most direct way it's the most comfortable most enjoyable there's no other way and uh, when you are time poor I feel like I'm always time poor the bike is the only solution and um, I just hope that the, in the future people will not always go for the car key in their drawer but maybe they'll go for their bike helmet or bike lock instead and I think that, that whole change of attitude is going to be huge um, to change and there's changing behavior is the biggest obstacle I think to getting people on their bikes to just make the switch no I'm not going to take the car I'm actually going to take the bike I'm going to you know I'm going to actually make a change and um, my big driver in all this is I have two young boys aged eight and ten and under no circumstances can my boy cycle to school absolutely no way it's it's traumatic enough for myself to get to school with them um but um so that's why i'm campaigning for safer cycling to school and uh, i hope the future is green and bright and i'm going to pass on to colin walsh now so colin and joe aren't here tonight but i can give you kind of a quick one-liner on both of them so colin walsh has been a member of Dublin cycling campaign for quite a long time he's but actively involved in our infrastructure group. Um, 
He's a kind of father and businessman who you'll frequently see cycle on either his cargo bike or his electric bike with his kids. Um, and Joe has been actively involved with our Fingal Active Travel Group, uh, doing some amazing work out there trying to make Fingal a much better place to cycle because it absolutely needs it. Um, Damien, are you, you're here as well, right? Yeah, have to Perfect. say you. Have to say a few words. Um, thanks, Amanda. My, my day job is as National Cycling Coordinator with Cyclist.ie, the Irish Cycling Advocacy Network, and it's a joint position with um, Tashka. And um, my background is in transport research and consultancy, and I still do some work for the Environmental Protection Agency uh, on steering committees for research. Um, I suppose my main interest is really in linking local level campaigning in Dublin with national level campaigning. I think you initially get involved in you know, wondering why junctions have such poor designs, but then slowly you get interested in, in countrywide issues and national issues. So I'm particularly interested in funding for cycling and um, the policy side, legislation, standards. And these are all things that we try to shape at a national level. So in, in Dublin, I'm always keen on nurturing the collegial and the social side of cycling. And hopefully uh, over the next few months, we can start to meet up again. And I'm delighted to be uh, appointed to the committee again. Perfect. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, everyone, for the introductions. Um, okay, we're going to move on to um, the annual member survey. So, Kiran, what did our members say in the survey this year? Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll share my screen here. Well, yep, it's just let me share there. And I'll... <clears throat> So this is the 2021 annual member survey. We started doing this in 2019. So this is the third year that we've had the, the member survey. So we're starting to see uh, comparisons with previous years and see different patterns emerge. Um, so the, the, the survey is kind of breaking down into six main parts. People's experiences cycling in Dublin, the impact of COVID and the pandemic, um, engagement members, funding and membership, uh, diversity and inclusion in the campaign, and uh, members getting more involved with the campaign. So the first section is cycling in Dublin, people's experiences cycling in Dublin. Uh, this is just a breakdown of what uh, local authority areas people are cycling in. So two thirds uh, have an experience of living in Dublin City Council, and then there's a, a fairly even split between the other three Dublin councils and a few people who uh, live outside of Dublin. Uh, the majority of people responding to the survey either cycle daily, so 58.5% cycle daily, and another 31% cycle more than once a week. So a significant majority are cycling uh, very frequently in Dublin, and that's their experience. Uh, so th this question here, we asked people what their primary reason for choosing to cycle was. So the, the, the biggest wedge here, the purple wedge with 60.6% is uh, convenience, is, is the main reason. And that's followed on 17% here, the blue wedge by environmental reasons. And then just under 13%, the green wedge is for health and fitness. Um, what I found interesting in this was we have the results here from 2019 and 2020. And you can see in 2019, 8.3% of people were referencing environmental reasons. In 2020, 10.3% were referencing environmental reasons. And that's grown now to 17%. So I, I guess that's... Um, in line with patterns on awareness of climate change and the impacts on the environment, it's now becoming a significant deciding factor in why people uh, choose to cycle more so than just convenience. Um, so we asked, in general, how satisfied are you with Dublin cycling infrastructure? So you can see by this chart that uh, the majority of the blocks are towards the dissatisfied end of the scale and not too many people are, are going beyond the middle ground in terms of satisfaction. Um, but again, we have a comparison from 2019, people were at 1.87 was the average score out of five, that increased to 2.1 in 2020, and that's up to 2.19 uh, in 2021. So I suppose there's um, some improvements there over time, but you can't really look away from the fact that most people are leaning towards 
dissatisfaction. So plenty of room for improvement uh, with Dublin safety and infrastructure is what our members are telling us. Uh, we asked people how safe do they feel when cycling in Dublin? So again, more people are leaning towards the feeling unsafe end of the spectrum. Uh, and we can see in the, the average scores from 2019 through to 2021 that there was um, a, a bit of a jump from 2019 to 2020. Uh, we have seen a lot of I suppose, uh, COVID mobility um, projects coming in place, but then a marginal drop between 2020 and 2021. So uh, perhaps we've um, plateaued in the last 12 months in terms of how safe people feel on Dublin's streets when cycling. Uh, this question we've asked every year as well is if you could change just one thing to improve conditions in Dublin, what would it be? And uh, there were a few suggested answers. The majority of this purple wedge over the last three years consistently has been to uh, build a citywide network, so build a citywide network of segregated cycle routes. So that's what most people are leaning towards. And then the, the orange wedge, which is coming in second place all three years as well, is uh, much better enforcement of road traffic laws. Um, the green wedge, which is growing marginally year on year, is to prohibit motor vehicles in the city centre. But this just gives an indication of what our members uh, are looking for and what we should be asking for is more segregated cycle routes and a network of them in the city. Uh, this, unfortunately, is people's experience of collisions or near misses over the last 12 months. So a quarter of people had neither a near miss or a collision, but uh, two thirds of people suffered a near miss while cycling in Dublin. And unfortunately, 10% of people uh, were involved in uh, a minor collision where no serious injuries were sustained. Uh, nobody's reported uh, being involved in a serious collision, thankfully, but um, you know, one in 10 people suffering a, a minor collision cycling in Dublin over 12 months isn't good. And two thirds of people having near misses is really bad. Um, We've asked people if they had a bicycle stolen in the past 12 months. So in 2020, 7% of people of our members reported having a bicycle stolen. In the past 12 months, just over 5% have reported having a, a bicycle stolen. And uh, we asked people how optimistic they are that cycling conditions in Dublin are going to improve in the near future, we said within five years. Um, so this chart is leaning towards optimism rather than pessimism. But again, if you look at the pattern year on year in 2019, so pre COVID, uh, the average score was 2.68. In 2020, this time last year, this was just after the summer in the first summer of COVID, the optimism was up to 3.57, and that has been tempered a bit this year. That's back down to, to 3.20. And that's what Kevin referenced in his um, annual report. There were a couple of um, eagle pushbacks against cycling infrastructure this year, which is probably influence some of that uh, drop in optimism. Uh, so the impact of COVID, we're in our second year of COVID now. Um, this question here is how has the pandemic affected how often you cycle? So the, the main change here is that in, in 2020, 35.7% uh, of people were saying they cycle about the same, whereas now 51.6% uh, of people are saying they cycle about the same. So that's probably just indicative really of uh, a return to more normal patterns of, of movement and transport as people get back to work and back to school and back to routines compared to this time last year where um, routines were, were very much shifted as a result of the pandemic and the lockdowns. Uh, how satisfied are you with the reaction of your local authority to the pandemic in terms of providing additional space for walking and cycling? Uh, it's kind of an even split in this chart um, when you add up very satisfied and dissatisfied. If you if you were to add weighting to the scores, you probably lean slightly towards dissatisfied, but it's a pretty even mix in this one. Uh, do you think the pandemic will result in long-term improvements for walking and cycling? Uh, this was interesting as well, that uh, the, the main shift here is that, that the red wedge here, which is expect a return to the status quo, in, in 2020, uh, under 16%, we're saying there might be a shift towards the status quo. Uh, now, 23.4% are, are expecting a return to the status quo. So again, that, that's probably um, you know in parallel with the, the, the demise, you know, the slight demise in optimism over cycling infrastructure. It, it ties in a bit with that. So um, yeah, people, people's optimism is down a little bit compared to this time last year. 
So in terms of engagement with the campaign, um, this is just asking people the, the primary media that they engage with the campaign on. So you can see that the, the newsletter there is the, the primary source, uh, followed by Twitter and the website. And then you have kind of Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, doing, doing a little bit of work as well. Uh, in terms of how often our members have heard coverage of the Dublin Cycling Campaign or our activities over the last 12 months. So um, people have been seeing us in TV, radio, newspapers and online news. So we've had a, a decent presence. Uh, just over a quarter of members haven't seen or heard of us in mainstream media over the last 12 months. So uh, we're doing all right there. Um, overall, how satisfied are you with the work Dublin Cycling Campaign is doing? Uh, Good positive response there. The majority are leaning towards satisfied or very satisfied. And again, the, the average score there is very steady. So marginal change over the last three years. So um, we, we seem to be on the right track in, in terms of what our members are telling us anyway. And then this is Dublin Cycling Campaign Vision. So Dublin Cycling Campaign Vision is for a vibrant livable city where everyone can safely enjoy everyday walking and cycling. And uh, pretty much an overwhelming majority strongly agree with that vision. So um, it's our, our guiding principle that seems to be on track as well. Uh, funding and membership question. So Dublin Cycling Campaign is, is 100% volunteer organization. Um, we ask the members to support the cycling campaign, employing paid staff and acquiring office space. So 85% are in favor of that. Um, that's good to know. Diversity and inclusion. Uh, Dublin Cycling Campaign is an inclusive and diverse organization. We ask people how much they agree or disagree with this. The majority agree or strongly agree. About a third are neutral on that. And then there's a minority who, who disagree with it. So um, generally a good signal, I suppose. Um, certainly room for improvement, but um, we're not. Uh, we ask people about specific areas where we think we could improve um, and socioeconomic background is uh, the, the area where people see most room for improvement, followed by ethnicity and then ability and mobility. And um, I think people left those areas in their uh, introductions as committee members as well. So hopefully we'll have um, further progress on that year on year and then make the campaign more inclusive and diverse as we go along. We asked our members, uh, would they support the introduction of policies to improve diversity and enable more people to get involved? And 97% said that they would support policies to improve diversity. Um, and then last year in 2020, we introduced uh, a 50-50 gender quota for Dublin Cycling Campaign's executive committee. And um, we followed up this year by asking members if they supported that. And just over 90% uh, of members said they supported um, which is a, a pretty strong endorsement. In terms of getting more involved with the campaign, uh, just a general question asking if you'd like to get more actively involved, and 43% said they would like to get more actively involved. So there is a pool of uh, willing volunteers out there if we can tap into them and um, the right area of interest and, and find the right expertise to help us out. Uh, so the survey went out to everyone whose email address we have. So not, we, we don't have the email address of all members, so any member whose email address we have um, was sent the, the survey and 94 members responded to the survey. Um, so I can take any questions if anyone has any questions on that. Well, okay, we have one question come in there from Donna asking, like, will we publish this information online? We will. Uh, we'll put it on the website in the next few days. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat there. Does anyone else? Okay. Yep, I completely agree with Connor. It's fantastic work as always, Kieran. It's really great to kind of to see those results and the year-to-year -year comparison on a lot of those numbers. Yeah, hopefully over the next couple of years, maybe start to build up a better picture of that. Absolutely. Cool. Okay. Vinny, do you want to, uh, can you share slides again and we'll go on to the motions? Perfect. We don't have the motion text in slides, do we? 
Uh, we do not have it in slides, but I can bring it up, no problem. So just bear with me. Okay. Do not adjust your set. Perfect. Okay, so we had three motions come through in time for, um, but before the deadline. Um, perfect. This is our first one, isn't it, Lee? Yeah, so th this is our first one, just to let you know that uh, I'm going to have a poll set up to vote on these. So, wonders of technology. Uh, so, um, if there's anyone who wants to talk to them, then I'll put up a poll and we'll take a vote on whether to accept it or not. Cool. Okay. Vinny, do we have Vinny Styles with us? We do not. Cool. Okay. Um, I can speak a little bit to this motion and then we can take a vote on whether or not Dublin Cycling Campaign supports the motion or not. Um, and then we move, move on to the other two motions. Okay. So this motion is about should taxis be allowed to use bus lanes? Um, there's kind of a bit of a history that you can kind of all read through there. Um, but I'll kind of jump down to like the believes in the resolve section of this motion, which is kind of uh, the Dublin Cycling Union believes that restricting bus lanes to buses and cyclists only will make it safer for people cycling. Um, it will foster safe, safer driving and it will make it a better place for people to cycle in Dublin. And I'll we'll jump down to this, this last bit. Okay, this motion resolves that the committee seek legal ways and any means in which taxis can be prevented from using bus lanes at all times. And this motion also seeks to have cycling logos displayed on every bus lane, regardless of whether or not there's a cycle lane there or not, as it is important that everyone is aware that cyclists can enter and use bus lanes, regardless of cycle lanes nearby or not. Okay, would anyone like to speak either for or against the motion before we jump to a vote? Um, if there's someone in the chat who would like to speak, just like raise your hand in the chat and Vinny can allow you to speak on the Zoom. But I see a hand from Donna there. So Donna, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, though I sort of, I support it, but yet I have concerns because I would prefer that we just had segregated cycleways and we weren't in the bus lanes because I also find buses um, particularly problematic, you know, um, and I'd like to away, like in Copenhagen where they, taxis i'd like to maybe combine this and i should have seen it first maybe amended to put that all taxis would be able to carry bicycles because in copenhagen when they put that in as a rule that they had to have bike racks on them to be able to carry bicycles they then became friends of cyclists because people would you know go into town maybe have a few drinks or you know the weather could change and they could decide they want to bring their bike home on it on a taxi you know so um that could you know then they then they they're no longer competing against cyclists or negative towards cyclists. So um, part of me wants to support it, but another part of me thinks you know we should be we should be looking for segregated cycleways and not be sharing with the buses either. And we should be trying to make um, taxi drivers our friends. Perfect. Thank you, Donna. And uh, anyone else want to raise their hand? Colin, and speak? I think Colin Ryder wanted to speak. Yep, Colin. Uh, just let me see oh, sorry, drop, who's dropped off there, I think. Um, now, uh, while we're waiting for Colin, maybe Charlotte? Yep. Go for it. I feel that it, was, it would be a little bit um, difficult for the taxi driver because one of the assets for them uh, to beat the traffic is to use, to offer the use of uh, the bus lane for the client that means uh, is going to to be a uproar in the community of taxi driver i believe and we are not going to be friends with the taxi driver <laughs> from that okay. all right thanks charles um, column and then Pascal, do you have a hand there as well? 
Uh, okay, we we'll go Martin. to Colin first. Yeah, Colin, Martin, and Marie. Yep. Colin. No. We need to activate his microphone. Uh, Vinny. Yeah, no, he's ready to go there. He should oh. be big. Yeah. Okay, we move on. We can't hear you, Colin. Um, we move on maybe to uh, Marie. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. And look, I, I, I suppose I am, um, I'm sorry, I don't know where my, my camera has gone to, but anyway, uh, you, you can imagine my face anyway. So just, yeah, look, I support, I, you know, I totally get the sentiment of the, um, uh of the uh of of the motion but i think there's a few things firstly in terms of uh having to seek a legal way to um prevent uh the bus lanes being used by, by taxis i suppose in terms of the dublin cycling campaign actually having to allocate any resources towards legally finding a solution on this you know i i, I i'm not sure it would be the best use of resources but i suppose secondly in terms of the dilution of the campaign for segregated cycleways as well if uh, a cycle um signage was to be painted on every single bus lane i think you know that would just give rise to confusion and i suppose the last point and i know it was made by donna and others like you know i don't think we need to make enemies or any more than than is necessary of the taxi drivers ultimately we have to convince cars that you know we need to be segregated from them um, and, 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 and I, I'm just not sure that going down, it would just seem to me like a rabbit hole to, 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 to kind of engage in a, in a war against taxis at this point in time. Thanks. And I think uh, Pascal and then, um, is Pascal, do you want to say something? He is gone. Uh, Martin, Martin Quinn. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. What we're leaving, what we're forgetting here is also the will of the people. Now, if we stop taxis using um, the bus lane stroke cycle lanes, it's going to add 10 quid, 15 quid, 20 quid or whatever onto a passenger's journey. You may lose the will of the people. You may lose the tailwind that we have from the uh, general public. And also, I think it's maybe a little bit premature as we have bus connects coming in where a lot of the cycle lanes will be adjacent to the bus lane. So I think there's two things we have to consider here. It's, it's uh, the will of the people paying, I mean, the taxi drivers are going to be frustrated, but there's a huge amount of people who are going to have to pay extra if their taxi is sitting in the general traffic and it's adding 20 quid to their, if they're, if they're say, a critical worker in a hospital or something going to work and all of a sudden their journey is an extra 20 quid extra. You, know, you could lose the, the will of the people. And also it's a little bit premature when you consider that as time goes by, when Bus Connects com comes in, we may have adjacent bus lanes, uh, a cycle, sorry, adjacent cycle lanes to the bus lanes. That's all I want to say. Okay, thanks. Colin Ryder, you want to speak now? Thanks very much. Uh, Chair Vinnie, can I get my screen, my Hold image? On now. Oh. Uh, there we go. See if that will work. We can hear you clearly, Colin. That's there you go. Uh, you should be able to see you now. Just turn on your video. Colin, you there? Colin, you're on mute at the moment. Yeah, yeah sorry. I, I, I'm sorry, uh, be as short as possible. I missed some of the conversation, so I don't want to hopefully I'm not repeating anything that people are saying. My system has been dropping out. Um, look, overall, this is this is a long standing issue within the campaign with them for cyclists generally. Over, uh, and I know, I know that within uh, certain sections of, of officialdom, certainly within the NTA and other, uh, some of the councils, they would, they would certainly like to see this issue coming, but they do realise, like Marie Sherlock has said earlier on, that it's like a, an unwinnable war at the moment against taxi drivers. And the reality of, the, of, of achieving it is, is would be a very difficult 
issue and is it the most important issue? I think uh, the issue of, of logos and cycle lanes has been, has been agreed and won. It was part of our Quick Wins project, which we ran a number of years ago and which was virtually accepted straight away. It's something that, that made a bit of difference in terms of the understanding of, of the, the, the reality that cyclists can cycle and cycle lane. But overall, the, while, while respecting the, the uh, ethos of the motion, I think it's a, it's a difficult one, the wording of it in particular, but uh, and, and, and what it permits the, the campaign to do, uh, certainly when the, while we would be generally in favour of the, of the process. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Billy, how many more people do we have to speak? Uh, we we'll just have one more. Uh, Feline and Jose, not quite sure. Uh, off you go. Hey, um, well, I'd just like to say that when they started doing this, when they started uh, letting taxis into bus lanes in the 1980s, there were about 2,000 taxis in the Dublin area. Now it's closer to 20,000. Like, it's just, I don't see how it's sustainable into the future. And as for Bus Connects and how we'll get segregated bus cycle lanes, like, I'm sorry, but Bus Connects will leave a lot of places within Dublin City without segregated cycle lanes. It'll be places like Phippsburg where it's just a bus lane and general traffic lane. You can divert to um, an off-road cycle lane, but if you're going into these villages, you'll be on the bus lane and there will be taxis on it. Like, I think Dublin Cycle Campaign should take a position on this. And I wouldn't be worried about making enemies of ta or taxi drivers. I mean, what has Dublin Cycling Campaign or any other cycling group made from their what friendship of <laughs> taxi drivers throughout these years? I, I don't. I wouldn't really be worried about that. I, I don't see what could possibly happen from that. Thank you, Belgian. Any uh, one more speaker? Ellen and Joan wanted to speak. Perfect. Okay. Right. Are we then happy to kind of draw a line on this conversation then afterwards and move towards the vote? Cool. I see some nodding heads. Okay. Perfect. Ellen and Joan. Just very quickly, this has come up year on year when we debate it year on year, and I'd really like to see maybe an amended version in future years. And um, the consensus every year has been that why poke that this is a bear too big for us to poke. And I, like Marie said, some others said, I, I I tend to agree. I think we're we're a small group, and taxi drivers are a big lobby, and I don't think this is a bear we should poke. But maybe in future, an amended version works that maybe we can lobby for taxi drivers to get the same once a year cycling training the bus drivers get that might be something achievable that uh, taxi drivers know uh, legally have to know how to how to um and um, drive around bikes maybe we need to rather than accepting the same motion every year accept or get someone to put in an amended motion which we can't do now which is maybe more bite size and achievable joan um, yeah, so basically, basically my comment is, is quite similar to, to Ellen's. I think that the the motion as it's worded is not realistic. It's too problematic anyway, what's contained in it um, for the, the various reasons that people have raised here already. And I kind of agree with a lot of both sides of the, 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 the points that have been raised here. So I think that's part of the problem of that motion. It needs to be something that is actually refined and achievable um, and definitely um, I think I think ultimately I would fall down on the, the points that uh, Mary Sherlock raised earlier as well, that I would fall in you know, on the category or on the side of voting against it for the pragmatic and practical reasons, as well as uh, the, the other problematic reasons. However, with the knowledge that um, I think Felgen raised there around Bus Connects, um, which is very important, I think, maybe to, to factor in, that's something that could inform any potential motions that we bring um, next year. Um, so I think we may, might need to revisit the issue but I don't think it's something that we can pass in this form, in my view, um, in, in this form. So that's uh, just my comments on that. Thank you, Joan, and thank you to everyone else who spoke. Can we move towards a vote now, Vinny? Um, so a poll should appear on everyone's screen in Zoom, and you should be able to vote for, against, or abstain on the motion. Mini FII um, hosts and panelists can't vote. Um, so I suspect there are some people who spoke on the motion here who probably can't vote for or against if 
Oh, sorry to hear that. I thought that panelists could. Um, see Do we need to rerun that vote? Or? It's not working. I've tried to vote and I can't. Yeah. All right, you all could right. do a roll call for the uh, panelists because they can speak. I, 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 we don't have a huge amount of time for a roll call vote, even though mm -hmm. I, I like the idea. Um, can we run the vote again? Uh, we can. So I can I can dump all the panelists out. Can we do that? I don't know if I can do that. Um, Yeah, we could, uh, Vinny, we could just bump everyone out and then bump everyone in again, if you want. Okay. Be complicated. Uh, it will be time consuming. Yes. Could we do a kind of a holding of hands? Oh, sorry, not holding of hands. Show hands. <laughs> Show hands. Thanks. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah. But uh okay so that's that's what we have at the moment sorry let me just try to do some magic here uh, so of the number who voted was 20 voted, and four we have six uh 13 against and one abstained and then from the panelists uh one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve uh, could you put your hand up, right? Not visually, use the little icon uh, if you are for this motion. Oh, so that's just the panelists, like the just raised the hand at the bottom of your Zoom yeah. panel. If you were uh, for you this wanna, motion, so put Martin your hand. has his hand up already. Do you want to disable his hand? I'm not sure if he's already voting. So just panelists at the moment. Sorry. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so that's uh, Vinnie, Gavin, Mairead, Emma, Connor, Damien, Ellen, Joan, Joe, Kieran, Siobhan, and Una. So that's a no. So nobody is for it. Can I have a show of hands from the panelists who are against this motion? Eight. Um, uh, nine, actually, to me. And uh, can I have a show of hands who are abstaining? Uh, two people, uh, three people are abstaining. Okay. Cool. Sorry about the massive rigmarole here, everybody. Um, as we talk through the next motion, we'll try and streamline this process a little bit. All right, Vinny, do you have a total count for us for and against? Uh, yeah, so um, we have 32 uh, people voted, uh, for the motion, six against it, 22, and abstained, four. So uh, it has not been carried. Perfect. Thank you, Vinny. Um... It was a really useful discussion as well. Thank you, everyone who contributed. Um, it's really useful to see kind of the, the nuance and different points of view on this issue. So we'll hopefully, uh, it honestly does help inform the committee about what we should be focusing on over the next year. These motions really do do that. Yeah, so even though this motion wasn't carried, there are definitely um, ideas and bits of information that came out of that discussion, which will be useful to us over the next year. Cool, okay. We'll go to the next motion, which is from Damien. So Damien, do you want to maybe spend like 60 to 90 seconds kind of talking through your motion? Yeah, I can go through quite quickly. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it's a motion about how Dublin cycling campaign plans for the year ahead. So currently, strictly speaking, we don't have a work plan for next year or indeed a budget. We tend to figure things out generally on a month on a month to month basis. Now, not for everything, but most things are decided really every every you know month to month wise or every two months. And I think we're always going to need to have to be agile and spontaneous and make things up quickly and reacting. But I also think there's a place for having a rough outline of what we want to do over the next year. And that could be divided up by local authority group. So what we want to do in Fingal or Dunleary or South Dublin or in the city, but also thematically what campaigns we want to 
want to focus on. So my proposal is that um, really before the, the new year kicks off, the new committee agrees on a rough outline work plan for the coming year. Now, there's nothing to stop it uh, being rejigged as we go along, but I think it will just help us plan a little bit better so that if we see there are you know, four big things happening in April or May, we can then go in February. Actually, we need an extra 20 volunteers next month. And now, now would be a good time to start looking for them. So uh, the wording of the motion is the Dublin Cycling Campaign prepares an outline work plan for each coming year so to help with planning ahead. I'm happy, happy to take any questions uh, or hear any, any, any thoughts. Okay, can people raise their hand in Zoom if they would like to speak either for or against the motion? Well, Maraid, I see a hand from you. Do you want to get us going? Yeah, well, it's just nobody else putting their hand up. I suspect it means that everybody agrees that it's a good idea. I just want to say I think it's an excellent idea and I think it should be done. I support the motion. Perfect. Thank you, Maraid. We'll go Donna and then Kieran. Yeah, I, I also support the motion. I think it's a really good idea and it's good for, um, to know then what the budget is for particular work and, and I have a plan going ahead. Obviously, there might be things unexpected contingency, but it, it, should be, it, it is good to have a plan for the future year. Good, good motion. Perfect. Thank you, Donna. Kieran. Um, well, I, I suppose it's, it's good to have a motion like that and, and a plan like that. It's, it often becomes a case of who takes responsibility for it and actions it. And that's where things like this tend to um, fall between the cracks. So um, if we pass this motion, who is going to action it? Because that, that's where, uh, you know, we do have informal plans for work and for long-term projects and short-term projects. and getting our motions for committees every six weeks or whatever um but it, it always falls down to one or two people to to keep all that in order so if there isn't responsibility uh then it won't work it's kind of my my two cents on it thank you karen is there any other hands to speak in this motion uh sandra has her hand up as well Sandra. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that it's actually uh, a requirement as part of the uh, Charities Governance Code that an organisation has a uh, an annual plan. So it's it's something that you're legally obliged to do now. The, obliged to do. the only the only issue around that is is this plan for the organisation as a whole. So this is where the whole restructuring conversation comes in. But let's face it planning and budgeting for the future, it, it is a no-brainer, I think, as, as Colin has just said on there. So yeah, I think it has to be done, but in line with what Kieran says, who's going to do it? At, at the moment, in terms of the current structure, I suppose that's down to the executive of Dublin Cycling Campaign to, to, to do that uh, until such time as any of that um, changes, if, if it does change. So that's all I wanted to say. Perfect, thank you, Sandra. Um, Kieran, I can't commit to doing the plan, uh, but I will commit that it will be discussed at the first committee meeting. So um, it will get done because as Sandra has pointed out, it is kind of required for us to do it. Do we have any more speakers or are we moving to a vote? Sorry, I see Dana's hand up, but I don't know if that's from an earlier. Dana, do you want to say anything? I think you should be able to. Yeah, you should speak there, Donna, if you want. I've, it's an accidental um, and I have to put it down again. All right. Sorry, Happens to the rest of Okay, do you want to move to a vote? Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, I've been frantically trying to figure out how to allow panelists to vote, but um, I cannot figure that out. I know you can do it, but oh, wait now. Just wait. 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 wait a second. Just a second. Uh, just talk amongst yourselves there for a second. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Colin Ryder is suggesting we ask, is anybody against it? 
Not all. Not all. Vinny has a plan. I have faith in you, Vinny. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And um, uh, Louise has a comment in the yeah. chat that might that's part. So Louise's question in the chat is: Should we be having a vote on this if this is a, a requirement under the Charity Act? Um, I, I want to vote through or down the motion because I want to give members that opportunity. I would encourage everyone to please vote for this if we kind of need to do it anyway. Um, Vinny, how are we getting on with? Uh, we're getting on there. Um, just uh, one second. So, and no, you can't do it. Sorry. It is do you want to throw a, we'll throw a vote? Hold. And I'll just like, is there anyone on the panelists who is voting against this motion? Perfect. Okay. Um, so a poll has now appeared for all the attendees. So if attendees would like to vote as well as so all the members on the call. Hopefully, get a quick answer here. That's a resounding. This bit is normally way easier in person. This is one of the few things that is slightly harder about the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Is if we were all in person, I would kind of just ask the room, like a show of hands, because I think this is going to be fairly clear cut. Um, but given that some people can use microphone and some people can't in this meeting, it's a little bit trickier. But okay, so that's that's the result, I think, Kevin. Pretty resounding. Uh, any abstentions? Any abstentions from the panel? No. Okay. Hundred percent. Vinny, and do you have enough information there for like a clear answer for the minutes or clear? Yes, I minutes? do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's perfect. Good. Okay, I assume that motion was carried, right? Motion was carried, yeah. Perfect. OK, can we move on to the last motion we have? Yeah. There um, we go. Very short and sweet from Paul Corcoran. Perfect. OK, is Paul Corcoran with us tonight? He's not. Cool. OK, I can speak to this motion then. Um, it's Pretty short and sweet. It's that Dublin Cycle Campaign calls on Dublin City Council to have a car free day at least one Sunday of the month from March to October within the city centre, extending to the, Royal, uh, the Grand and Royal Canals. Okay, would anyone like to speak either for or against this motion? If you do, just please hit the raise hand button inside of Zoom. Cool. Uh, I see a hand from Kieran. So Kieran, if you want to get going, and then I see Charlotte, Louise, and Colin as well. We'll get you in after Kieran. I think this is kind of a no-brainer as well. I think Dublin is decades behind other European cities in terms of having car-free days, um, and I, I don't see any issue with the extent of what Paul is suggesting we ask for there. Uh, let's ask for as much as we can to be car-free and let other people decide that we should get less than what we ask for. But um, at, at the bare minimum, we should be having car free days once a month uh, during the period suggested, if not all year round. And if we don't push for some kind of motion like this, there's probably a fear that we drift back towards pre-COVID normal use of streets where people forget what it's like to have a street that is car free. Uh, so I strongly support this motion. Perfect. Thank you, Karen. Go to Charlotte next. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but uh, having all the, the city uh, uh, car free, I'm just thinking about uh, the coach, um, the tourism uh, coaches who may uh, have difficulty on those days. Uh, the second thing is would be uh, interesting to link this uh, car-free day with all the European uh, city. Uh, together, we are stronger. Perfect. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, up next to speak, can we Louise? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah do we, we should be good to go? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, just listening to other people talking about the other motions, I think this is a really good idea. I think we could, you know, uh, as Charlotte said, other cities do it, we could follow suit. In my mind, it's perhaps a little bit too specific, you know, to, to say specifically within those canal areas. Um, so my perspective would be great idea in principle, but maybe just with a, tweaking the wording a little bit so that we could have it a little bit more open so that it could be done in such a way that we wouldn't get the backlash and we wouldn't get the kind of, you know, some of the problematic um, discourse that is following some of the, the campaigns uh, that we've been calling for recently. Um, and so it could be done in a way that it would be really impactful, would draw families into the city centre, um, but perhaps not specifically to, to that, those zones, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Colin? Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Uh, I know you can't see me down, but look, I just want to support what Kieran has said there earlier on, and uh, essentially, like like we were just so so far behind the rest of the the globe, nearly at the stage. But you, you look at you look at the the examples from other cities, particularly in South America and Latin America, in terms of what what opening the cities uh, to to people for walking and cycling on uh, weekends usually, and uh, in some some countries are doing. Bogota was probably the most famous of the Latin Colombia. Uh, for opening its streets to pedestrians and cyclists on the weekends and banning cars in certain areas. <laughs> and it, it just makes, it has made a huge difference in terms of people getting on their bikes and people using active travel. So this, this is something in terms of motion overall, yes. Look, it's, the guards have been the biggest obstacle to this happening in the past years or in, in Dublin City. And they've, they've called a halt a number of times. People will be aware that even for the Velo City Conference in Dublin, we lobbied very hard to get a city centre cycle uh, during the Velo City, as happened in, happens in all Velo City, er, in Velo City Conference uh, towns in, in the past. And look, it, it's, a, it's, a bit, it's going to be a battle again, but it's certainly it's a motion that we should support and, and ho hopefully make it happen. Perfect. Thank you, Colin. Um, is he a hand from Michelle Hardyman as well? Hi, Michelle. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, so I just like to follow up on what Colin just said there. Um, I didn't uh, see the motions in advance, but I was delighted to hear this motion just now. Um, I have worked and traveled all over Latin America and Central America and South America for multiple years. And I would have first started visiting Colombia specifically because I heard about the, um, the Sunday cycles and all of the bike infrastructure in Bogota. And from there, I had spent, I've spent a good while and a good few trips in Colombia touring just to be in certain cities on Sunday mornings. And it is absolutely magical what happens between, they, they close a lot of the streets in Colombia and then it has spread to most of South America and an awful lot of the Mexican cities um, where they close, like not just the, the equivalent of the canals, but the equivalent of the Slorgan Julie Carriageway, which would be closed between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. Um, um, and just the whole world like, on their rollerblades, on their buggies, with the footballs, those bike workshops, gym workshops, juice machines all along the streets. And um, it's, it's magical. It's fantastic. So I am delighted to hear this motion and I would be very in favour of it. For whatever you get, I don't know which is the best way to go. Ask for every Sunday and then be happy to compromise or ask for one Sunday a month and then work from there and expand. Not sure. Perfect. Thanks, Michelle. Um, got a hand from Connor, and then we'll go Joan, and then Donna. Is that a hand from you as well? Uh, yeah. Hi. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, it's um, Bogota has been mentioned there a couple of times, and I just shared an article saying how they've been having a cyclovia for the last twenty-five years, and that was from an article from three years ago. Um, I think it's an amazing, just exactly as Michelle said, I think it's an amazing way to allow people to experience and to imagine the public realm in a different way, one that's for it's people friendly and where it allows people to walk and sing and dance and drink coffee and, you know, let go of their children's hand and just to experience, you know, a part of the city in a completely different way and in a way that's not dominated by a, a single mode of transport. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I think this is great and I'm fair play to Paul. Yeah, thank you. Oh, and I might also, sorry, just add just a uh, column's mention of Velo City. Um, at the time, the bicycle, the cycle route for the um, cycle parade in Velo City was the shortest one in, the, in Dublin, was the shortest one in the history of Velo City. And while they were very um, keen to show off the while Dublin City Council, the host of Velo City Dublin 2019, was very keen to show off the eco, the the, the bias, the eco bio, the bias for Dublin Bay. Um, you know, we really did push very hard to bring it into the city centre where it have more visibility for more families would, would be able to partake. Um, so maybe this is a way for this to happen now. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Connor. We've got a Joan and then Donna, and then I think we're good to move to a vote. Yeah. Um, so I'll be as quick as possible. So I, I guess I'm kind of echoing a little bit what Louise said and some of the last points that um, Michelle made as well, that um, the only criticism I'd have about this is that it's narrowly worded. I would much prefer much more expansive um, word, worded or, or intended, intended motion that it's, you know, not limited by its wording. So I think if it can be read that the, the clause of at least in this makes it optional that the campaign limits ourselves to one Sunday of the month from March or October, because I would prefer <clears throat> that the campaign pushes for the maximum possible number of car free days, because as people have said already, the council and the Gardaí and whoever else will push back and that will be reduced no matter what we start out with. So I think if we can come, if the campaign can come forward with the, the most maximal demand possible and then see what what arises out of that so that's my only kind of slight concern about the wording so if we're agreed on our interpretation to to read it that way then absolutely i'm totally in favor of this as well thanks thanks john um donna do you want to speak and then we'll go to ellen and then a vote yeah um i i suppose most of, of what i was going to say is said, but just to say i'm very supportive of this and um, I think, you know, when we're, we're looking for it, I think we need to promote it as what it's going to look like um, with, with a car free city. It's going to be vibrant. When we hadn't got cars um, during um, COVID, the city was, was, there was nobody about in the city. You know, it, 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 it looked, it was terrible, but like without cars, um, but lots of people, um, you know, children playing on the street, hopscotch, you know, whatever's going on. Um, and, you know, um, lots of people out and about. Um, and, you know, so I think that's the vision we want to show of what, you know, what, what's good. And I think we'd get the support, I think, of a lot of the businesses then, because they'll see that a lot of people will come into the city and, um, you know, availing of the cafes and the and the restaurants and um so I, I think it's really positive but I think we need to you know I think we need to promote it in a in a very positive way it's not just that we're against cars it's just we want the city to be um you know a people people friendly uh vibrant city um which which will be when you take the cars out thanks perfect thanks Donna Adam and then we'll move to Josh so, um, two really quick things. One, I think uh, it'd be really good to make sure we have um, allies like disability organisations on board and get their concerns on board before we start. Um, um, partly because, mostly because it's the right thing to do, but partly because you need allies. Um, and the second thing was, I think it's really important that we find which parts of DCC um, are, are keen on this, because when they closed College Green there two summers ago, it was shit, <laughs> excuse my language, but it was drab, dreary. College Green, that should have been a fantastic opportunity to show what the car for, go because of the plaza. And I don't know what they did, but it was absolutely terrible. So if 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 it doesn't, if, if we push our way through again against DCC and they're not with it, they could kill it by making it all, but by making it so drab and awful that no one wants to go in anyway. So that, that'd be my only recommendation that we make sure we have allies and we have good support from the, the people who can nudge it in the right direction. Wise words. Thank you, Alan. Okay, we'll move to a vote on this motion. Yeah. Cool. Okay, um, so similar again, the people who have been allowed to speak in the last few moments won't have an option to vote, but we'll do kind of a yay, nay, or against in a moment.
Cool. Do we have enough votes coming through on the other side, first, Vinny? Uh, so we've 18 on, yeah, so we've 18 so far, votes. Perfect. Okay. Hey, well, um, we're not quite finished. Sorry. What, what, come in there. Anyone else? Last call for votes. So that's 19 so far. Yeah. And now, uh, is there any 19 people who voted? So, uh, show hands from the panel uh, who are for this motion. Uh, that is, and uh, show of hands who from the panel who are against. I, I think Donna had her hand up anyway, and it probably so. Well, Donna can vote. Uh, yeah. So one against. Is that right, Red? Uh, any abstaining? Perfect. Okay. Well, Vinny kind of tots up all the numbers there for that last motion. Um, thank you, everyone who submitted motions. Thank you, everyone who talked either for or against the motions. Um, this motion section of the AMM is really useful for the committee as we think about kind of trying to shape what the campaign will be up to over the next year. It's a great way for you, our members, to have input into what we do. So thank you, everyone, for getting involved there. Um, yeah. So, so do you have a tally for that one there, Vinny? I do. I'm not quite sure about Mairead for sides. Her hand is up and I'm not sure what it's for up for. Mairead, are you there? I made a right mess of everything. Yeah, I kept on putting my hand up and down. I voted for the motion. Okay. So that's fine then. Sorry about that. So that motion has been uh so we had 31 people voted and it, it, 31 people voted for it. So it's carried. Perfect. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, just a point there. Uh, Sandra had made a point about agreeing um, the provisos if the motion is carried. I don't know if you saw that message in the chat. Um, we're not doing amendments to motions tonight, but we will absolutely take this conversation. Mm. Um, I, there's, there's a lot of details to work it out, and doing them either via amendments of motions at the AM is probably not the best venue for doing that. But if you are interested in getting involved in making this a reality in Dublin, do send an email to info at Um and we'll make sure that you're kind of included in whatever plan we come up with for how we move this forward, whether or not it's writing a letter to the council or writing, asking particular councillors to put forward a motion or however we go about doing this, that's mm -hmm. obviously the next step to figure out. It's like, what are the next step of actions? But this motion has definitely set a clear direction for how we want to go. Cool. Okay. So that was the last motion. The motions is the last section of our agenda for tonight. So I just wanted to thank everyone for kind of giving up your Thursday evening and coming along to this, this meeting. Um, congratulations to everyone who is elected to the committee for next year. Uh, I also want to say a huge thank you to Connor Cattle and Kieran Ryan and Mary Caulfield who are stepping back from the committee. Um, their contributions over but last year and the last many years, in some cases for Connor and Kieran, it's been absolutely incredible. Many of you probably don't know what they've been up to, but they have been absolutely instrumental in some of the most amazing campaigns we've run over the last few years. Um, so huge thank you to them. Um, thank you everyone for coming along tonight. Um, I suspect some people are going to stick around on the Zoom call afterwards for a bit of a chat. So if you're kind of interested in sticking around and doing kind of like a pub via Zoom with everyone else here. <laughs> You're more than happy to stick around. We'll have a few chats and a few drinks. Cool. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thanks for chairing, Kevin.